Hello, glad you could join us today for Bible study. Uh, today we are going to be looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, this is one of Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians is. Actually, Paul may have written four letters to the church at Corinth. There is a letter that we do not have that is referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9 as the previous letter. We don't have that one at all. It's lost. And uh, then there is 1 Corinthians, which we are familiar with, uh, that was written probably sometime around 52, 53, 54, somewhere along in there. And uh, then we have uh, a severe letter that was written by Paul to the church at Corinth, and it is either lost or uh, it may perhaps be identified by some scholars as what we have in 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13. Uh, I am more inclined to believe that the severe letter uh, is one that is lost. And uh, then the letter to 2 Corinthians, which is the one that we're looking at today in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So, uh, so glad you could join us, be a part of this study. And uh, so we're going to jump right in. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Father, thank you so much for your love for us and Lord for your uh, guiding us by the Holy Spirit to instruct us, to teach us, to help us to come to understanding of your scripture and what it is teaching us today. Now speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, again, I, I know if you have studied the Bible for some time, you are uh, certainly uh, familiar, at least at some level, with uh, the church at Corinth and what Paul uh, did in establishing that church. And uh, today in 2 Corinthians, we are looking at a church that Paul is trying to help uh, get uh, developed. Chapter or First Corinthians, rather, is a picture of what Paul is doing in uh, leading people to Christ. You remember that he was there with Aquila and Priscilla. He was a tent maker while he was in in Corinth. Uh, he was with them for eighteen months. The only other church that he spent more time with, other than uh, Corinth was Ephesus. He was 18 months in Corinth. He was uh, about two and a half years, almost three years in, in Ephesus. But uh, certainly Paul has his hands full in trying to get this church in Corinth off of the ground. And, and here are some reasonings uh, behind that just very quickly. Corinth was one of the three largest cities in the Roman Empire in that day and time. Uh, it was on a trade route. There were hundreds of thousands of people, even millions of people, who passed through Corinth uh, every year, and you know where you have a large metropolitan city like that, you're going to have uh, brought into that city by the travelers a, a wide, wide variety of ideas, philosophies, uh, religions, and uh, so much of that was erroneous. So much of that was uh, absolutely against trying to present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, a lot of people just wouldn't hear of it when they heard Paul preach, but there were some who listened. God uh, put it in their heart to listen to what Paul was teaching and preaching and uh, instructing them. Uh, and so uh, a, a remnant of a small church was beginning. And then in 2 Corinthians, you have a, a picture of a, a little more developed church, but still a church that was struggling internally with uh, people who had let allow into their lives a mixture of things, a mixture of ideas, a mixture of beliefs that were causing them to have real problems with trusting only in Jesus and trusting only in the true presentation of the gospel. And uh, so uh, because of that, Paul is actually being challenged uh, by false teachers who had come through and who had uh, spoken to the church. They were only 50 miles from Athens, Greece. So there was a lot of uh, philosophy being taught in that day and time. And they, they had a high level of admiration and respect for uh, 
philosophers who could stand and give great orations for hours at a time on religion or most any subject. And uh, because of this and because of the, the powerful impact that some of those false teachers had, there were some great speakers, some great orators among those folks. And uh, uh, some of the people in the church at Corinth were being drawn into those philosophies and ideas that were in opposition to the gospel. And it was causing a great deal of, of difficulty there. Corinth was a city that was full of sin. There was, uh, there was a temple there that had a thousand temple prostitutes. So immorality was just a way of life. And uh, you can imagine trying to establish a church in the middle of that kind or those kinds of uh, ways of living and ideas that people uh, allowed into their hearts. So let's jump right into this. The title of our lesson today is Holding Fast to the Gospel of Jesus. Holding Fast to the Gospel of Jesus. And that's what Paul is, is trying to do. Now I mentioned uh, the first two letters. There's a letter that is lost. It's mentioned in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. And uh, then there is 1 Corinthians. Then there is a harsh letter or a severe letter that is written to the church also. And then we have 2 Corinthians. Uh, so uh, th this is a little bit of a pattern of what's going on here. Uh, let's look at uh, chapter 11 in 2 Corinthians as Paul is uh, addressing some serious problems here and he is actually defending himself. Have you ever had anybody to question what you were saying and doing? Maybe you were teaching and they and they said, that's just not right. You're just wrong. Or we don't like the way you're, you're trying to say that. We don't like the way you're trying to teach this. Well, th that was exactly Paul's situation here. Um, and so he's writing a part of this letter of 2 Corinthians is a letter of defense. It is also a letter of chastisement. Uh, it's possible that the severe letter, which I personally believe is lost, it's possible that uh, parts of chapters 10, uh, 11, and 12 uh, may have been a portion of that severe letter that Paul had, uh, had written to the church. So let's, let's read from uh, chapter 11, verse 1. I wish you would put up with a little foolishness from me. Now, Paul is, is not being foolish. He would never uh, be foolish uh, intentionally. This is a little tongue-in-cheek here. He is saying that uh, uh, he uh, is, is saying, you know, he's making fun of himself in a way. I wish you would put up with a little foolishness from me. Yes, you do put up with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Now, he loved the people in Corinth. He really did. And he says the reason is, is that I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present a pure virgin uh, to Christ. Now, what in the world is he uh, referring to here? He is referring to uh, Christ uh, as, uh, to the church rather, as being the bride of Christ. And certainly we have uh, teachings about that in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. Let's, let's take a moment and just go there. Revelation, chapter 19, uh, verses 6 through 9. Uh, the marriage of the Lamb is announced. Then, this is, this is from John's writing to the church, uh, to the churches, seven churches. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because of our Lord, because our Lord God the Almighty has begun to reign. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has prepared herself. She was permitted to wear fine linen bright and pure for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. This is a picture of the bride of Christ, of Christ coming to claim his bride uh, at, upon his return. The bride of Christ is the church. And Paul is uh, saying here in his letter to the Corinthian church, he said, it's been my attempt uh, 
my effort in preaching and teaching to you was that you might be the bride of Christ, uh, pure, uh, unadulterated, holy, so that you would be clean and pure uh, for Christ when he comes at his return to claim his bride. So uh, that's why he says this uh, in the um, in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to prepare a pure virgin to Christ. So he doesn't, he doesn't want any sin or any error to uh, be predominant within the life of the church in Corinth. He wants to present Christ with a pure virgin church. Well, you don't find too many of those, do you? <laughs> and he says in verse 3, But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be corrupted from a complete and pure devotion to Christ. Now, you know that uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, you know the story well of Satan, uh, the old serpent coming in and deceiving Eve and causing her to... Uh, to, to <laughs> to put it in a foolish kind of way, to take a bite of the apple and encourage encourage uh, Adam to have some of the fruit that was on the tree that, that God had told them, you, you don't eat of this tree. So because of that, they were, they were impure. They sinned, and they brought sin into the world. Uh, verse 4 in uh, chapter 11, For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we did not preach. Now, how many Jesuses are there? There were a lot of people who were named Jesus in that day and time, but there was only Jesus, only one Jesus who is Lord. So if somebody comes along and they're preaching another Jesus, another Savior, uh, or you receive a different spirit, in other words, uh, that, that they're telling you there's more than one Holy Spirit, don't believe it, don't believe it. Only one Jesus Christ, only one Holy Spirit of God, which you had not received, or a different gospel. How many gospels are there? Just one. He says, if you uh, are presented with another gospel, don't believe it. You stay with what I taught you, with what I instructed, and I explain to you what the gospel is. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, of his coming, his death, burial, and resurrection, and uh, you know the fact that one day he's coming again. If anybody comes and they preach any other gospel other than that, don't listen to it. Don't believe it. Uh, or a different gospel which you had not accepted, you put up with it splendidly. Uh, in other words, if you think I presented something that I shouldn't have presented, <laughs> you call me on it if you want to. You can make these accusations against you, but I've told you the truth. I'm going to always tell you the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, let's consider two or three things quickly. Paul had a loving relationship uh, with the church at Corinth, and he was being challenged, so he's defending himself here. Uh, and uh, if you want to read over in Galatians, now this is a, a different letter to a different church, but he's saying the same kind of thing to the church in Galatians. And uh, he says it real plainly there. He says, I'm amazed that you were so quickly turning away from Christ who called you by his grace and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, the same kind of thing he's saying to the church in Corinth. But there are some who are troubling you and want to change the gospel of Christ. Same problem. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. Now, he's real plain when he writes to uh, the Galatian church. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. Now, that's the same kind of, of uh, strong language and strong uh, teaching that Paul is giving to the church, this, is, this may very well be a part of that sorrowful letter, that harsh letter that uh, we know that he did send to the church in Corinth. Um, he, was, he was concerned for the unity of the church there in Corinth because he had these other people who'd come along and, and, and presented the idea of a different Christ or presented the idea 
of a different gospel, then there was disunity in the church. There were some who believed one thing, some who believed uh, another thing. Uh, Peter and Apollos were two other apostles or teachers who had come uh, to the church a, a little bit later on. And, and Paul's problem was not with Peter and Apollos. Paul's problem was with uh, the, the Judaizers primarily. These were people who had a background in the in the Old Testament, a background in Jewish faith, and certainly Paul did too. But Paul knew how to interpret the Old Testament so that they understood that the gospel, the good news of Jesus having come, was the answer to what was in the Old Testament about the fact that a day would come when uh, he would enter into the world, Isaiah 53, uh, teaching that there would come a day when Jesus would come into this world. Uh, so believers in Corinth had allowed, even welcomed, uh, some boastful teachers to speak and to teach in the church and proclaiming a different gospel from what he had taught. So that was a real problem. Uh, Paul taught that there's only one true gospel and that Jesus alone is the way to the Father. That's what Jesus himself said in, in uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Paul had told them that very, very clearly. And yet here were these other guys coming in trying to say that uh, there's, there's, uh, there's another way. There are a lot of people in the world today who believe this idea that uh, all religions lead to, lead to the same result. That it uh, doesn't really matter what you believe when you die, we're all going to go to heaven anyway. Is that true? Absolutely not. And those were the kinds of things that were being mixed in there with the true teaching of the gospel that Paul had presented to them. Uh, the second part of this lesson comes out of that same chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 5 through 11. Now, I consider myself in no way inferior to the super apostles. That's, uh, that was a, a reference that Paul was using, that there were some guys who, who weren't just good preachers. They weren't just good technical preachers who were preaching uh, the, the truth of the gospel, that there were guys who came, came along, they were like super evangelists. Now, I believe in evangelism. I believe God has called uh, uh, men into the, the ministry of being an evangelist. Billy Graham, for instance. Uh, God didn't call Billy Graham to pastor a church. He called Billy Graham to be an evangelist and uh, uh, one to introduce people to the good news of Jesus Christ and to salvation. Uh, and there, there are a lot of wonderful evangelists out there. But there were some who came along, uh, they didn't teach the gospel uh, that Paul had taught. Uh, they, and they were such all oh, wonderful speakers. Uh, they, they, you know, the, the words would just roll off of their tongue and phrases and, and all oh, the people were just, you know, they, they were just enthralled by that. Now, not only should we be appreciative of what preachers of the gospel, teachers of the gospel, evangelists, all of them, uh, be appreciative of their ministry, but be cautious in what you hear so that you don't hear and you don't accept something into your heart and mind that is not the gospel, that does not teach the truth of the gospel. And, and that's why Paul comes up with this titled Super Apostles, these guys who are super teachers. Though untrained in public speaking, Paul's talking about himself again now, though, tr though untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. Uh, Paul is saying, you know, I, I may not have a glib tongue. I may not have that, uh, uh, that just rolling off of my tongue kind of speech, but he said there, there's... <laughs> That doesn't disqualify me because I'm not a trained orator. Because I am a trained apostle, a teacher and preacher of the truth of the gospel. How did he get that training? Go back to Galatians again. He explains a little further that he, uh, 14 years earlier when he was writing Galatians, he says, 14 years ago, I was taken up to the third heaven. <laughs> 
whether I was in the spirit uh, or whether this was, uh, you know, uh, in flesh, I, I can't really say. But what I can tell you is I was instructed by the Lord Jesus himself, and he taught me and instructed me uh, about things that that normal mortal man uh, cannot see and cannot experience. But Jesus brought him up into heaven so that he might experience the fullness of the truth of the gospel and to say, Paul, uh, look, uh, what I'm giving you to do, the job that I'm giving you to, to do, and that is being the apostle to the Gentiles, the, the missionary to the Gentiles, I want you to know this is absolutely the truth, and I'm going to show you the, the outcomes of all of your ministry. I'm going to let you see so that when you're preaching or when you're teaching, there won't be any question in your mind but what this is the outcome. This is what heaven looks like. I believe that's what I believe that's what Jesus did for Paul. I believe he, believe he let him see a little bit of heaven. So, Paul, there won't be a question mark in your mind as to what you're doing and why you're doing it. But this is the end result. is salvation and eternity uh, with me. So, the Corinthians preferred those teachers who were highly trained, uh, highly taught in public, Speaking now, I had to take a course in public speaking when I was a student at Union. It scared me to death, uh, but I did okay. I didn't make eight pluses in it, but but I passed the course, and uh, I I can you know uh, this is no false modesty. I can tell you there are a lot of guys out there who can preach down the stars, is the way the the, the preachers say among themselves. Guys who can preach down the stars, and then there are others who. Uh, can't preach down the stars or don't have that gift or that talent, but who are wonderful teachers and preachers of God's word and teach his truth. Paul could do well in his teaching and preaching, uh, according to Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 19 through 34. He, he defends himself well there as far as his ability to communicate truth and to communicate it clearly, but he was not trained as an orator. He was not trained as a public speaker. However, you won't find anybody in Paul's day who knew any more about the Old Testament uh, than Paul did. Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, who was the teacher of his day, a conservative teacher of his day. And Paul was highly trained in the knowledge of the Bible, which was the Old Testament of that day and time. Paul knew his Bible. Uh, but he was not an orator like those guys from uh, from Athens. Uh, Paul's purpose was to proclaim the gospel clearly and simply and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of bringing people to salvation. And he explains that again in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, that that's, that's, the, uh, that, that's the ministry that God had given to him was to be able to speak the truth and the absolute truth, uh, you know, if you swear, you, you, if you're put under oath, you're going to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, Paul was sworn to that, absolutely, and he's saying this uh, to the folks there in, in Corinth. Well, rely on God's power to share the gospel. The Judaizers and the Gnostics, the Gnostics were those knowledge people. Oh, you know, we, we, we know more than you do. Uh, because you know we've we've you know we're climbing heaven's ladder. We're going to get there by what we know, and by our good works. And the Judaizer says, uh, "Well, uh, you not only have to believe the gospel, you not only have to believe in Christ, but you also have to be circumcised. And and there are some rules that that you have to go by that are in the Old Testament uh, that that you have to keep, uh, or else you you can't be a Christian. You can't be saved. Well." You can imagine what that was doing to a young church who didn't have any background in going to church. They didn't have any background much of anything as far as, as the knowledge of God was concerned. But they were really mixing those folks' minds up royally uh, by what they were teaching. They were those false apostles. Uh, Paul's purpose was to proclaim the gospel clearly and simply and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of bringing people salvation. That's what we ought to do when we share Christ with with someone who is lost. Uh, 
uh, we, we simply share the good news of Christ, share the scriptures with them, give our own personal testimony, and let, let the Holy Spirit do the convicting and the convincing and drawing of that lost person to Christ. Paul says that's exactly what he was trying to do. But the Corinthian church didn't like the fact that Paul uh, did not charge for his ministry. Now, isn't that strange? Um, you say, well, you know, these super apostles, you know, these, these super uh, philosophical evangelists come into town, and, and if we were going to listen to them, if we were going to invite them in for a week of, of uh, teaching and preaching, uh, uh, then, you, you know, we had to pay them. They expected payment. They expected to be paid well. And Paul says, I didn't do that simply because I didn't want you identifying me with those super apostles. I didn't want you thinking that I only came here to preach the gospel so I could enrich myself, so I could get paid. He said, that's not it at all. I didn't take anything from you. I worked with my own hands as a tent maker to help support myself. And uh, besides that, the, the folks up in Macedonia, they knew about my situation here. They knew what I was doing. And, and they sent uh, financial help to support me while I was preaching to you. Sure, it would have been fine if, if I had received uh, uh, you know, some payment from you. There's not anything that teaches that, that a minister cannot uh, receive payment for his ministry. That's his work. That's what God's assigned him to do. That's his responsibility. And he, he deserves to be paid. Uh, for doing that ministry. But he said, I didn't want there to be any false idea here that I came for the money. And uh, he said, but you guys got mad at me because I wasn't asking for money for preaching the gospel. But you were, you were glad to pay those super apostles. You were glad to pay those philosophers and those guys who were teaching you error. You were glad to take money from them. But you think because I wouldn't take money from you that I must not be much. You know, I must not be much of a preacher, a teacher. I must not be much of an evangelist if, if, if I didn't talk like they did and if, 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 uh, if I didn't take money from you. He said, that's wrong. I didn't want anything to distract you from the truth of the gospel that I was teaching you while I was there. Third thing, and very quickly, uh, that Paul is teaching us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, he says, confront those who preach a false gospel. He said, you guys that are in the church in Corinth that know the truth, that know that I taught you and I preached the truth to you, somebody comes along and they say to you, uh, well, you know, Paul had it wrong. Uh, Paul, you know, he should have told you this and so and this and that. Uh, and so, you know, Paul was, Paul was just wrong. He said, those guys that come along trying to tell you that, you need to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and say, you're the one that's wrong. We know the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know the Holy Spirit is living in us. And you're not going to come in here and tell us that there is another gospel and that there is another Jesus that we don't know anything about. He said, don't do it. You don't let those people preach in your church and teach in your church. Paul did not need the commendation of man only of Christ, and he tells us that in chapter 10, in verse 18, right before this, uh, in chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 10, 18, says, Paul says, I only needed the commendation of the Lord Jesus Christ about what I was doing. I didn't need the commendation of man. I didn't need people to come up and brag on me and tell me, oh, what a wonderful job you're doing. Oh, it's just great. No, he said, I only need to know when I lay down at night that I have told people the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has instructed me in that truth, and I've passed it on to those folks who are lost and needed to hear the gospel. Paul pointed out that the false apostles were like Satan, who was a deceiver, a deceiver. He said, don't let those folks into your church, just like Eve over there in the garden. Those folks are going to deceive you, and they're going to tell you something that is absolutely false, absolutely wrong. Don't allow it. Don't let them into your church. The Old Testament gave warnings about false prophets, even as far back as Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 through 22, that, that they needed to be on their guard against false prophets, against those people who taught error uh, way back then. Jesus warned in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, he warned about... Uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, 
uh, which is the same thing he's saying. Don't let people come in here and try to tell you something that's not true. Um, uh, Jesus warned about Satan, who he called a liar and a murderer in John 8, 44. He said, he's talking to the, to the Pharisees. He, he said, you guys are liars and murderers. Uh, and he said, your father is Satan. So uh, Paul is warning the folks with that same kind of message. He probably quoted what Jesus had to say about that. Don't let liars and murderers and thieves and wolves come into the flock. Don't let them do it. Uh, you, you, you stop it. Because uh, Satan can make himself look good. You know, Jesus said that, yeah, <laughs> Satan can even appear as an angel of light. Oh, look how good I am in the garden again. Satan appears as, uh, we, we say, a serpent. And we don't know what that serpent actually actually looked like. But he looked good, and he he was so slimy and so so smooth tongued that he talked Eve right into disobeying and challenging God's word, and sinning and bringing all of that on all of creation of man for as long as this world is here. He says, "Don't do it." Uh, what are some ways that we can recognize false? teachers in the church today uh, and folks we need even that you know we we've not totally outgrown all that if somebody comes along and preaches uh in, in your church and and they tell you things that uh you think well oh, that's not the way my bible reads good for you you need to check it out and you need to be careful what you allow and what you hear there are some preachers that you can see on TV every day, every day, who will tell you, oh, you know, Jesus just wants you to feel good. He just wants you to feel good. Oh, you ought not to have any, any sense of guilt that comes from sin. You ought not to have any of that. you got enough other stuff to worry about. Don't you believe it? Uh, or uh, somebody comes along and, and they tell you, well, you know, God wants you to be happy. And uh, God, uh, God wants to give you uh, a, a livelihood that is just wonderful. He wants to give you all this money. And uh, they may not say it quite that crassly, but that's what they mean. They, you know, Jesus said, don't let the wolf in sheep's clothing in here. Don't let him do that. Paul is saying the same thing. Don't you let guys come in here and tell you something that's just absolutely not true. Uh, you check it out and you see what I taught you, and uh, then you'll know what you need to do. Well, uh, our time is, is gone. Uh, those who teach and preach a false gospel in the church should be confronted because the results of their false teaching has eternal consequences. Eternal life versus eternal death and hell are what's at stake here. That's what Paul was saying to those folks uh, in Corinth. And that's why he spoke so hard to them and so harshly uh, in this particular passage because he knew the destruction that Satan was creating in the life of that church and he wasn't going to have it. And so he's trying to give them the tools to be able to correct that situation. Oh, thank you for listening today, and I pray your blessings, uh, God's blessings upon you today. And I hope you're enjoying these warmer few days that we're having now after that cold and snowy week last week. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for loving us, Lord, and for giving us the, the word of life, the word of truth in your word, our Bible. Lord, that we can read it, study it, and know that through the power of the Holy Spirit to help interpret and help us to understand what we read, Lord, we can know the power of your love uh, and Christ's likeness in, in that experience of studying your word. Go with us now through this day in Jesus' name. Amen.